So Dax, this SVB thing, how close were we to just total meltdown? You know, it was pretty dramatic for a few days, but in the end, I think it was actually kind of a boring run in the middle situation, which is exactly what you would want from the banking sector and, and the government. I actually think it was a great example of a rare example of our government working extremely well. Uh, but I think that might have gotten lost a little bit in the details. Yeah. And, qu- and quickly, I mean, we thought we'd do a podcast today. Didn't know it all be sort of resolved at this point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think the news was just coming out really fast. Uh, I think it was actually happening so fast. I was seeing the reactions kind of delayed on Twitter. I saw like when the news came out, you know, of how they're going to resolve it they were already, you know, going down that path, but there were still people reacting to like the initial information. So that's how quickly they got done. The news cycle couldn't even, even keep up. Yeah. So you said that there's been sort of some lost in, in translation here, like people not realizing that this was actually handled really well. Could you talk about what reactions you've seen where people are missing that? Yeah. Maybe we should just talk a little bit about what exactly happened to summarize it. Um, Yes. So when was like last Thursday, right? There was effectively a bank run that happened on uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which is a bank that is like often used by startups in the tech industry. Uh, there was news that they lost a bunch of money on investments, which with rising interest rates, like it's just kind of bound to happen with with some of these banks. And that concern, their concern over that spiraled into a full panic of people pulling their money out so they kind of shut down operations and then the FTC came in and and took over. So I think the initial reactions were, oh no, this is terrible. A bank has failed. Uh, then I think there was a lot of people had memories back to 2008 of being like, oh great, now the government is going to bail out, you know, these rich like Silicon Valley investors, VCs, et cetera. Because there was a big VC crowd making a bunch of noise about this, which was also kind of annoying. Yeah, I want to talk about that too. Keep going. Yeah, so it, it was, I think that a lot of reactions were around this political angle of, they kind of bucketed this as, as a, into another example of uh, a bunch of rich people gambled and lost money and they want the government to make them whole, which has happened a lot in the past historically, but this situation wasn't exactly that. I think that's kind of what was lost in just in the chaos or everything that was going on. Yeah. So I think people hear Silicon Valley Bank and they think like startups and they think venture capitalists and like all these people are doing really well. But could you talk about like th- this was not a malfeasance or whatever, like this was not people gambling in ways that are just super risky. Like this was sort of like normal bank operations, unfortunate circumstances. And then a lot of fear, but the people that like ultimately would have been hurt so badly if the government didn't bail it out, were not just like rich people. It's all the people that work for startups, right? I mean, could you kind of break that down for me? Yeah, I think the reality is that sometimes businesses fail. You know, I've, I've only worked at businesses that have failed, but thankfully I've only worked in industries where when a business I'm building fails, it doesn't really you know, ruin anyone's lives. It's maybe annoying for someone to switch to something else if they were using my product. But sometimes banks fail, just like any other company, a a business, a bank is just a business that's run by people that can sometimes fail. Uh, But when banks fail, it kind of creates a lot of chaos for their customers. And that's what the situation was. There were people that were running a bank who, for whatever reason, it failed. Uh, Those people, I understand, you don't want to, like, save them because they kind of ran this thing and it failed and they should kind of pay the price or like the system should should learn the lesson and the data point that exists from their failure. Um, But the customers were just people that deposited their money in the bank. When when any of us deposit our money in a bank, we're not going to go review the bank's balance sheet and like keep up with the quarterly meetings to make sure that the bank is operating the way we want them to. Like none of us really have the overhead. Then it's not the time to manage that overhead. Uh, so anyone that had their money deposited there, again, just like any other business, you're just, you're just a customer. Uh, all of a sudden, this you know 
this business is is starting to fail. That's actually why we have a government, right? When there are situations where a random person just gets hurt. It could have been you, me, like the fact that I didn't have my money in SVB is effectively random. Like I'm not like some genius that knew not to have my money in there. So the people that did get hit, it is kind of random. And the people, and in this case, the people that were were hit were people that, uh, you know, a lot of startups that employed other people. So just having them, uh, you know, fail with the bank doesn't really make sense. Uh, you know, they weren't in charge of running the bank or operating the bank, uh, just like none of us really are paying attention to our own personal bank operations. Yeah. So a few things I want to unpack. One, I guess the unique thing about SVB is a lot of the customers being startups have huge deposits. Like they have huge account balances because they've raised $10 million in venture capital or whatever. Right. So normal bank fall fails with just like normal consumer accounts. Like a lot of them are going to be under that FDIC insurance, the $250,000 limit. But in this case, I think I read it was like 95% of deposits at SVB would have would have been lost. You know, if this weren't, if somehow the government didn't step in, somebody didn't make them whole because all these huge balances at startups. Is that all accurate? This was something that was kind of lost in, in some of the chaos. The money didn't vanish. There wasn't a bunch of money that someone gambled away and it was all gone. It was unclear how much of it was readily available. They did lose some. But, you know, it, it could have just been like two or three percent that kind of causes this panic. So making the depositors whole they didn't have to look like the government coming in and filling in like a two hundred billion dollar gap. And in fact, that's not what happened. If you read the, the document that the FDIC put out, uh, it looks like they were able to find a buyer for for the gap and for all the debts and all the assets that SVB did that would make all depositors whole without the government even having to spend anything, any taxpayer money or anything. They do have like a backup fund in case there are like short-term gaps while they while this stuff gets figured out. But this is a really boring part of our government that none of us really, I think we often see the beginnings of things like this, but we never really hear about the endings, right? Uh, one of my favorite stats is the Bertie Madoff situation. When, when that went down, we all heard, okay, he stole all this money and this was all gone. Uh, and it took them years to figure it all out. And not many of us heard the ending, which is, I think they recovered like 85% or something. It was some like oh, crazy wow. amount of money that they recovered. So ultimately, and they also even paid out uh, least to most. So if you, they like nice. sort of the investors by who had the least with them and paid those out whole first. Yeah. And then some of the people that had more with them, you know, they didn't get percentage wise, they they didn't get all of it back, but you know, it was it was like a good way to do it. So they just tracked it all down and then and they made it all work. It takes time, but this is like the thing that they're good at. They kind of kill it when it comes to this type of thing. So I didn't know that, that the the Madoff situation, most of those people were made whole, I guess. That's that's good. Yeah. Because you, you heard all those stories when, it, when the news was breaking about, you know, bus drivers losing their life savings, that whole thing. Yeah. But you, you don't. You don't hear the ending. So I want to talk about the takes. You said, oh man, now that I know we're trying not to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, some of the people on Twitter have been upset that like that people are like expressing they shouldn't be on the hook when a bank fails. Like it's not th their responsibility to sort of split their bank their money across several banks or several accounts to stand to the limit. I think it's totally reasonable to think that we shouldn't expect banks to fail. Like the, I guess the takes that bother me on Twitter I've seen are like. It's a risky thing to put your money in a bank. You should know that. Like, really? Like, is it? I don't, I don't think so. Is that, does that make you mad? Like, when I see those takes, it makes me mad. Yeah, it's like, let's kind of be reasonable and kind of practical. You don't really want every single person in the country thinking that hard about whether they trust their money going into a bank. Um, and it's kind, of un, it's kind of an unfounded fear. Uh, Yes, the process of running a bank is very complicated. And some like the FDIC closes a bunch of banks every year, just like this. It just happens to be a very big one. Um, it is tricky. But because of that, it's also one of the most heavily regulated industries ever. If you look at what banks looked like 100 years ago in this country, that was a risky time to put money in banks. Like that would like anything, it kind of is like what crypto is today. Um, like banks were going under left and right. They were making their own currencies eff effectively. Like all this crazy huh. stuff was happening, um, and all these regulations we've discovered were and put into place over the past you know hundred years or so 
lead to a pretty good system, a system in which a bank having a situation that I guess Phoebe did is effectively resolved in, in three days over a weekend, right? Uh, that's really incredible. It's like no other part of our government. If something goes wrong in any other part of our government, like you're not getting a resolution in three days, right? No, right. This is, this is a rare part of the system that works really well. It's not risky. It's, uh, there is complications running a bank, but there's like a countermeasure here with uh, with all the regulations and the way the government operates and how all the insurance stuff is structured with the FDIC. Uh, it's a miracle that all works really well. And that's kind of what's exciting about the situation. We can kind of get to witness that in a tangible way. And do you think, had they not acted this quickly and we had gone into this week with that all still kind of up in the air, no word from the government or from the whoever, the Federal Reserve, do you think... Like, what do you think the outcome would have been? I don't know. Maybe it's dumb to even guess, but I feel like there was an urgency. I just couldn't, I just can't even imagine that being the case. Like it was so, this the, this whole organization exists just to react to situations like this. So I just can't even imagine what that would have been like. But yeah, if they hadn't, and I think this is probably still happening to some degree, people are kind of reevaluating where they have their money and maybe, you know, centralizing their money in, in less risky banks. I personally use all these like weird new new banks but i'm personally not really moving anything around well yeah all the extreme takes i was seeing on twitter were like every regional bank will fail it'll be just the big four that are too big to fail left standing and i don't know how much that's just extreme online speak there definitely is some kind of reaction the other thing that i saw that was also a little annoying um and i am not gonna i think having looked at the profiles of some of the people saying this, I think I knew what they were doing. Like they knew what they were doing. It wasn't they, like you're talking about the founders and people, investors or whoever that were just trying to like, no, well, that, that's another thing we can talk about. But the thing I was going to mention were there were a bunch of takes that were like, Oh, anyone with more than 250 K doesn't deserve protection from the government, or whatever, making it seem like these were individual bank accounts that were affected. Yeah, like they weren't. They weren't individual bank accounts for the most part. They were businesses. Like, yeah, the average person doesn't really need more than that much sitting in a bank account. Only businesses need that much sitting in a bank account because they might, you know, spend that much over the course of three months for their operations. Yep. Um, so I think people that was also few, they kind of were like tapping into the, this like outrage thing that that annoys people. So yeah, it was pretty disappointing to see just like the immediate opportunity that people saw to like you know get get attention and get get engagement around that thing it's just harmful long term like i think a lot of people are going to walk away from this situation again just hearing the beginning of it not understanding some of these details and just remembering this as, as yet another situation where something corrupt happened yeah can we talk about the the like uh what's that guy's name is it not founders fund but he like Peter worked Thiel? with no is the guy that Jason? worked like it Jason, Jason, yeah, 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 worked with Elon Musk on the Twitter stuff, uh, the all caps tweets, just all the like, if you don't make this right, the world is going to end. There were a lot of those tweets. Yeah, it was really annoying. Those, uh, I think everyone was joking about. The, 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 I don't really follow him that much. I find that guy really annoying and his whole crew, like Jason something and and David Sachs and a bunch of those like VC people. Um, they're kind of always chattering with this stuff. Uh, people were joking today. <laughs> and I, I don't think they were joking. They were literally commenting on how they're taking credit for the resolution. They're like, oh, really? Yeah, in their podcast. Because um, like they were making a bunch of noise around around this thing. I found it kind of cringy. It was like a bunch of VCs were getting together being like, we are going to make this right. Like, we're going to stand up, blah, blah, blah. And we all know this is a very boring government procedure that is just going to play out the same way it always plays out. Uh, it's just, to me, it felt like, wow, they just don't have anything that they need to like insert themselves and like try to, you know, be relevant. I mean, didn't they, there's a reason that the run on SVB happened in the first place, right? Like it was founders or like VCs telling all their port co's founders that they need to pull their money out because it didn't sound like from what I understood that the SVB underlying issue where they had to raise a little capital, am I uh, overstating that saying they had to raise a little capital or am I understating like it didn't sound like a major catastrophe, and then it was enough to spook whoever it was, Peter Thiel and Founder Son. I don't know all those people. Yeah, I think they just couldn't immediately find a buyer for it, so that was like, oh, okay, they're screwed. We should pull our money out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would guess it was like twenty percent of it was the actual situation, and then eighty percent of it was just from the bank run, ensuing bank run that happened. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, 
I think even just with that initial thing, the FDIC would have probably stepped in because I think you have a limited amount of time to find someone gotcha. to plug that hole before before they step in. But yeah, a lot of it was kind of manufactured and engineered. Um, I'm seeing like crazy conspiracy takes on all this stuff where there are compelling, but it just requires these actors to be really smart, which I just I just don't think <laughs> is the case. But they're like, this was all coordinated. So to make it more difficult for the Fed to continue to increase interest rates because now banks are failing. And I'm like, oh, that geez. might be how it plays out because now the Fed has to think twice. I don't think they're going to slow down hiking just because of this, but we'll see what they do. Um, but yeah, like no one, no one is that smart, especially <laughs> not like a bunch of VC guys with a podcast. VCs. I'm very biased against VCs, so I got to be careful not to just say bad things we're gonna sd's gonna raise a series a in six to 12 months so i might just be screwing myself oh no. by let's, saying stop. let's stop talking <laughs> <laughs> we just like the good ones you we know you're out there you hear us right now you're probably if you're listening you're probably one of the good ones yeah for sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay we're getting way over the top here so there's a few takes that i would like to hear your take on your response to uh because my i mean i'm just much more alarmist i think my immediate take in the aftermath was not, oh, wow, this was just an example of the government doing the right thing. Uh, I just get swayed too much from everything I read online. What do you think of Simon Wardley's thread? Because he, I mean, he's Britain, I think. He's not in the United States, not from the United States. Uh, he may have a different perspective on it from their politics over there. I don't know. But I wasn't smart enough to understand it. That's why I'm asking you. I didn't understand his thread, and I need you to to make it make <laughs> sense for me. <laughs> yeah, I think to summarize his thread, he uh, his take was it was kind of what you were saying earlier that putting your money in a bank is risky. If you claim that it's anything other, you should nationalize the bank, and it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be like this private system. Uh, I just don't think it needs to be that black and white. There's there there's options of like just complete free market chaos and then like completely you know like public nationalized thing right i like i said i think banks are in a really great situation where uh they are private so we have the diversity and the benefits that come from you know a bunch of different private companies emerging and competing with each other um but you still have a heavy amount of regulation probably more than probably the top three most you know regulated industries so you don't have the full chaos um so I feel like the situation is, it, it's great. Like we found this nice balance between these two extremes. And I think he was saying you can't have a balance. It's either one or the other, which I obviously disagree with. And I think he also was missing the point that the, the quote everyone keeps tweeting is like privatize the gain, socialize the losses, which is a problem to have a good capitalist society. Like you can't do that. You have to let losers lose. And they're kind of bucketing this under that situation of like, oh, like these people lost their money and, and we're saving them. But this is actually perfect. Like the statement from the from uh, Janet Yellen was was exactly what you want. They're like, we're not saving the shareholders or the investors in these banks because they they made a bet and they lost money. That's good. Like they, that signal needs to make it back. We're only going to save the customers, which is exactly the, the perfect harmony of everything you want. So I think in 2008, this isn't exactly what we got. So to me, it feels like we learned a little bit in 2008 and now like we're doing it pretty well. And I feel like we're going to continue to continue to do it well. Yeah, I remember the stories. I think it was 2008 when all the stories came out about what happened with all these bailouts, like where the money was actually flowing and executive bonuses and stupid stuff that like just I don't know how people can do in that setting and not <laughs> fear the repercussions. I don't know. Yeah. But in this case, all the people, I don't know who, who's an investor in SVB. Like who are these people? I don't, I don't they know. must just... be super wealthy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, but the thing is, it probably is also like pension funds that oh. invested in it and they're going to lose money, but they're probably heavily diversified. So that like one, you know, one blow up like this is not really going to cause anything. The 2008 thing is also funny because that's another example of all this hearing the beginning, but not hearing the boring end. I think we all heard that the government was buying all this garbage, um, quote unquote, garbage rated investments that these banks lost a bunch of money on. So government was like, OK, we'll buy it off you to, you know, to save you. And that was kind of upsetting. It turns out those actually weren't garbage. And fast forward 10 years, they actually made a ton of money for the government. <laughs> Wow. And the, the the Fed actually ended up reinvesting that in a bunch of infrastructure projects and, and things like that. So, yeah, this is a just a complicated long term space, more long term than anything we like deal with day to day. Um, 
And these are just like the biggest nerds that are in charge of this stuff. Like they just, <laughs> they, they know, they know how to do this stuff. And it's really impressive. So everything is very complex. And these stories just remind me of that constantly. But how do you keep track of this stuff? Like, how did you hear the end? Because I, I would love to be informed and not just hear the big flashy news story and then get <laughs> outraged and then forget about it. Like, what do you do to stay on top of things? You seem very uh, responsible. Well, nothing specific. So I think I'm in a kind of a unique situation because my dad is uh, my dad is a software engineer, but he spent most of his as the last half of his career in the finance world. And he's actually just a full time day trader now. And he worked at he actually worked at a before he retired and became a day trader. He worked at a uh, company that specifically bought distressed assets. So that, that was their thing. So when SVP a company like SVP has an issue, they come in and they they're the ones making the pitch to buy the the stuff. So I, I just constantly hear the type of thing from him and just hearing like, we're just not, in, it's just like anyone external talking about the tech industry. Like you realize like they don't really know how all this stuff works. It's kind of similar in finance. It's just as complicated of a space with just as many smart people in it. Um, it's kind of hard as an outsider to to really keep track or understand it all. I have nothing else to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> like, I'm just nodding and smiling. Uh, yeah, I mean, my answer to your question is there's like, we, we just can't keep like, up. There's no way I can benefit from this. Yeah, I can't <laughs> yeah, keep up. Want, my dad my is not a day trader. If you want to <laughs> call exactly. him up, you guys can chat. I'm sure he would like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know anything else about this situation. So I, I wasn't expecting it to be so tidied up so quickly. So that's great. I'm, yeah, I'm glad we do have some friends that had funds there, right? So yeah, uh, I mean, like it still has to play out fully, but you know, it's headed headed the right way so far. Yeah, I'm mainly curious to see if the Fed ends up reacting in terms of their rate hike schedule and and what they have planned. But besides that, it's pretty much a blip, and I think by next week, people probably will have forgotten about it. <laughs> perfect, right when this uh, podcast episode comes out, uh, it'll be perfect timing. <laughs> 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 just as everyone has forgotten remember uh, that thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should rename it to remember that thing and so that's remember tomorrow. that thing yeah because <laughs> <laughs> it's always in the past uh it's funny well we got to do another whole episode on interest rates because i hear people say oh another interest rate hike and i don't know what any of it means and i'd love to know because you sound like you know so <laughs> <laughs> hmm. that's basically this podcast it's turned into uh dax teach me things you smart that's basically what it is. Here's the thing. We're running out of stuff. This is like the last category of thing that I know about. Um, oh, no. Like we did back end stuff, which, you know, you, you know about the same as me. Then we did front end stuff, which I knew a little bit more about. You know a lot more. Now we're doing finance stuff. And then that's it. I think we have to retire this podcast after that. Oh, so we could get into a topic that I know more about. Like. Oh, that's true. Uh, Hang on. <laughs> All of your audio of visual stuff, like oh, you know, way more not, than that. Nobody cares. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> I want something cool. Hang on, not finance. I know a lot about. I got nothing. I really can't think of anything. Uh, the Ozarks. Do you want to yeah. you know, do some episodes about the Mark Twain National Forest? Well, what we never did that nutrition episode we talked about. Oh, we got to do a nutrition episode. Yeah. I still can't believe you're keto. There's a little teaser. I'm not fully the... keto, but oh, I have okay. keto phases. But yeah. Keto phases. <laughs> I have keto tendencies. <laughs> I'm not yeah. a keto, okay? I just have keto <laughs> tendencies. <laughs> uh, well, that'll be fun because I'm vegan. You're keto. Together, we're as annoying as you can be when it comes yeah. to nutrition. <laughs> that'll be fun. Okay, cool. Well, that's enough for this. See ya. See ya, Dex.